Okay, welcome. Left 261, Delta College. This is Thursday, September 30, class session, which is a review session because this week you're working on exam one. So I'm here only to answer your questions and you can throw your questions in the chat or you can vocalize them. Uh, I have some things I've observed that I can help you with if you don't have anything that you need done immediately. In particular, Mathematica brings many ways for you to plot functions. And here are five different ways that you could plot or prepare a plot of a basic surface. And they each have their advantages and disadvantages, but kind of the structure that you're learning to do is to create a plot structure, create multiple plot structures, and then bring them together with the show command or the manipulate command. And in that way, you can create kind of a detailed plot structure with many elements. So I might demonstrate the difference between these right here. It's not a difficult difference to comprehend, but sometimes one of these plot structures is more effective than the other. And the ones I would use most often, parametric plot 3D, contour plot 3D, plot 3D. Those are the ones I use most often. Spherical plot 3D is a newer addition to Mathematica and graphics 3D can be very, very useful when you're trying to create a diagram or create an object with many elements. Okay, so if you do not have a question, that's where I'll start. Uh, some observations, just to make sure we're all on the same page. Remember your exam one is due by 11.59 on Tuesday, October 5. Your exam one, I share a screen with you, is posted on our website, semesters, Math 261, we're in week five. And so exam one is posted right here or under the assessments. I'll click and open that. It's also posted under resources and assessments. So you may have already started working here on exam one. Okay, so remember exam one has this cover page. These are the conditions of the exam as I explained them on Tuesday. So uh, when you submit your exam, I require you to include this page signed. I would not grade your exam without this page. And then you have five questions here on five separate pages. You don't have to use these pages to write your answers down, although you certainly could do that. You certainly could print out and write on these pages. Here are the five questions. But I do want you to organize your work in a thoughtful way. I'm getting you know, lots of paper submissions that are really a bit too hurried. You're like, oh, here's my papers. Oh, here's my pictures. Oh, here's one PDF that contains them all. I like the fact that you're starting to learn how to submit a single PDF, but you do need to put your papers in order. You do need to put your name on your papers and you do need to organize your work so that it's readable. It's a really obvious question, like why should I write my name on my papers? Because I just submitted that paper in a file and has my name on it. Well, that's absolutely true. But when I open the paper, 
I'm just looking at a bunch of writing. I like to make sure that I don't misassign papers or mislabel papers when they come into my folder. So it's just a good practice to write your name on a paper. In fact, it's not even a bad practice to write your name on every paper and to number the papers that you submit. You know, I see a submission with three pages in it. And then you get back a graded submission. You say, wait a minute, there were seven pages in my submission. Well, you might've thought there were seven pages in your submission, but your submission may have only had three pages in it. So when you number your pages, one of seven, two of seven, three of seven, et cetera, then if something's missing, at least I have a clue that something's missing. And I know immediately who this belongs to. So this fits under the category of organize your papers and give yourself time to organize your papers. When you're doing things at the last minute, it's very difficult to see obvious mistakes. So organize your work and give yourself sufficient time to organize your work. You need to do some more practice using Mathematica so that you understand some very basic things about Mathematica. And that involves looking at the documentation for examples, but also following the conventions of Mathematica. The very basic convention of Mathematica is all internal commands are capitalized. For example, show, plot 3D, parametric plot 3D. And all commands or functions in Mathematica are delimited with square brackets. So whereas you and I write natural log of x in this comfortable, old-fashioned format, cursive LNX. By the way, why is it? LNX instead of NLX, if we're trying to say natural log. Mathematica writes LOG capital L bracket X. That's the natural logarithm of X in Mathematica. And when you write any version of LNX, as you're used to writing on your paper, Mathematica just doesn't understand what you're writing. So you need to practice using Mathematica, giving yourself time to use it, and following the appropriate conventions. Uh, yeah, why is natural log abbreviated LM? Somebody should answer that question for me or do some research. You might not have to answer it immediately, but maybe you could ask me later. So here's the next suggestion that fits in with the one above. When something doesn't make sense in mathematical or any of your calculations, let's find out why and let's ask questions. And that requires you to reserve sufficient time to ask questions. I am very, very, very bad at managing cars. I mean, as far as I understand about cars, if I turn the key and it goes on, then everything's okay. But if there's a warning light on the dashboard that says check engine, and I ignore it or don't do anything about it, I'm headed for serious trouble. And I can't just say, oh, the check engine light's on. I wonder what that means. Or the check engine light's on, I'll deal with that later. No, you deal with it right now. So when you're working in Mathematica, you're sending me some sheets, that's good. I appreciate your practicing in that. But you have to find out if Mathematica is giving you a result that doesn't make sense or giving you no result or giving you an error message, you need to find out why. Maybe the consequences won't be as so bad as blowing your entire engine in your car, but you do need to find out why so you can use it correctly and verify your calculations. You're using technology to verify your calculations. So when something doesn't make sense, you find out why. And that means you allow yourself enough time to ask the questions. And again, when you're working in Mathematica and asking question, Send me the actual notebook you're working on. Do not send me an email that says, my Mathematica notebook doesn't work. Do not send me a picture of your Mathematica notebook that doesn't work. 
You don't go to the garage and say, my car has a check engine light on, where's your car? I left it in the driveway at home. You don't say, my car has a check engine light on and there's smoke coming out of the hood. Here's a picture of my car. I, I'm trying to be humorous and I'm trying to prod you a little bit aggressively, but I need to do this. So you bring your car to the garage or you have a tow to the garage. So here's my car. Can you help me out, figure out what's happening? I, I want to emphasize that I'm only saying this because I'm extraordinarily bad at cars. <laughs> And I made some mistakes with cars and I paid for those mistakes. I don't want you to make the same mistakes while you're learning this material. Okay, this is enough of the preaching portion of today's session. So what questions can I answer for you? Or would you like to work on this demonstration right here? I would prefer to answer your questions and even if they were questions about the exam, I don't mind that. I will tell you if I can't answer something or won't answer something, but you still might have some questions about why I stated something or what something I wrote means or what you're supposed to do with something. I'll answer any question I can and I'll tell you directly if I can't answer the question. Is there anything I can do for you first? Okay, then, uh, and you can still throw this in the chat window and I'll respond to it, but give me a second here. I think I'll pull up a Mathematica window and give you an example of what I mean by these different graphics objects. Got it, got it. Got it, okay. Uh, a couple things when you're dealing with Mathematica in general. And on my computer, I often have Mathematica just open on my desktop, running, right? But after I've gone through several Mathematica notebooks, I've assigned variables left and right and up and down. Sometimes I get some variable definition collisions where I use one variable here to do this, one variable here to do that. So it's not a bad idea to quit Mathematica and then restart it. Well, of course, save your work, whatever you're working on, but to open up a fresh notebook when you want to develop some problem or examples. So I'm quitting Mathematica, I'm reopening. Some of you did try to experiment with Mathematica online. And uh, I don't mind if you do that. Then I might have to make the sample notebooks I post on my website available to you in another format. So if you are express, uh, if you are uh, interested in using Mathematica online, that's a service in a browser. Or if you want to try doing that, let me know, and I will open access to my notebooks in a different format. Okay, so I am going to open a Mathematica window and share it with you here and give you a demonstration of this. First, I'm just gonna share the Mathematica window, but later I might share my desktop if I dig into the documentation or anything like that. But let's talk about maybe the simplest graphing object I could do Let's graph a sphere. I'm going to increase the size of the type so I can type. I'm gonna do some other things as well. And I guess I'm gonna to jump to sharing screen faster than I thought I was going to. So I can show you some of the menus that I see in Mathematica. Okay, now I moved on to sharing my screen and I might have to enlarge the type as a result, 
But let me just put a title in my Mathematica notebook. Style, title. Uh, this title right here tends to be a little bit too large, but I'll just say graphing a sphere. And you notice that Mathematica has under style in the menus, title, subtitle, chapter, section, subsection, text, etc. Mathematica is really an entire document preparation system. And uh, some people use it more effectively than others in that sense. I do not use Mathematica to prepare documents, but you can essentially prepare entire documents and articles inside of Mathematica. Okay, so I click back on space. Let's say that I want to plot a sphere. So let's try the simplest straight ahead plotting of sphere that I can think of. Plot 3D. And let's give Mathematica an equation of a sphere, which would be, you know, x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals radius squared. But if I'm doing plot 3D, I have to present a function for Mathematica to plot. So I solve for z. Well, z equals, let's take sphere radius two, four minus x raised to the two minus y raised to the two. But I'm gonna have to take the square root of that. That's a function. I can't say plus or minus the square root. I have to say square root. I need to tell Mathematica where I'm going to plot that function that I just gave to it. So I need to give X and Y ranges. So let's say X is minus two to two and Y is minus two to two. And this is the most basic plot structure that I can construct. There's a lot of X and Y here that don't make sense for this, but Mathematica will interpret that to the best of its abilities. Oh, okay. My first error. Range specification is not of the form, blah, blah, blah. Okay, what did I do? Well, it turns out that I left out a comma. Do you see how I specify the X and Y ranges? I make them a list. X, beginning, minus two, ending two, and separated by commas. Anything in a brace, curly brace in Mathematica is called a list. And list is one of the fundamental objects that Mathematica uses to organize information. So it was just telling me that my Y list didn't make sense. And Mathematica says, doesn't make sense by saying range specification is not of the form blank. Okay, try again. Oh my goodness, it's a sphere or it looks like part of a sphere. Let me shrink it so we can get a better handle on it. There we go. Well, I understand what's missing. Well, what's missing is I only graph the upper half of the sphere. Uh, maybe my organization in what, the relationship between the X and Y axes, it looks like a little bit of a flattened sphere, but maybe I can deal with that. But first let's get the rest of the sphere going. Well, here I've graphed the square root of something. I need to graph the opposite of square root to get the bottom side. So can I have two plotting functions? Can I have two functions in one plot structure? Yes, no problem. But first, I'm gonna do some indenting so I can read this better. Good, I just did simple return keys or enter keys on my machine. You don't evaluate a command in Mathematica until you say shift enter. Here, I'm going to say now, Excuse me. When I'm doing full screen, I do not always have the chat window in front of me. So if you're trying to get my attention, no problem. Just throw something in the chat. I did open up the chat window now, so I see it. So what I want to do, remember, list is fundamental object in Mathematica. So I want to give Mathematica a list of things to plot. So inside the plot command, I put in these curly braces. And because I'm extraordinarily lazy, I copy and paste. And I'll put a minus sign in front of that square root. And now I've given Mathematica a list of two things to plot. 
And lo and behold, I have a sphere. Again, the size is a little bit troublesome and the ratios are a little bit troublesome. So I think what I need to do is tell Mathematica to make units like one to one, right? So I'll do that by saying aspect ratio. Now there's different commands I'm gonna use and you can look these up, but if you wanted to make your thing look actually like a sphere, you want all the units to be one to one to one. So that command in plot 3D, that option is called aspect ratio. I don't want full, uh, one might do it right here. I think I want to be more specific. Uh, let's try one. I'm curious. Okay. It made me a decent sphere. It's still kind of like wrestling with me. If I touch it and move it around, it doesn't seem to want to keep it in that format until I release and then it draws the sphere. But as I'm moving it around, it's not doing a good job of keeping those units one-to-one, -one, is it? Let me be more specific, aspect ratio one-to-one-to-one. -to -one -to -one. That does not seem to impress Mathematica at all. In fact, it seems to have broken it. So I think I'll have to go back, trial and error, to just saying one. Now, the problem is, this is still not a really good presentation of the sphere. This like, oh, let's do the upper half and the lower half. So I need a better way to present a sphere and let's move on and try something else. The one that you've used most often is contour plot. And I've given you some examples of contour plot, but contour plot takes the raw equation of a sphere and tries to find all the points that satisfy it. So if I say contour plot, x raised to the two plus y raised to the two plus z raised to the two, this is how you naturally express a sphere equals four. Mathematica will try to express all the points that satisfy this equation. Now notice how Mathematica is already giving me error messages, tiny type, but too few arguments but there's another more important error that I wanna deal with first, is that remember the equal sign in Mathematica is used for assigning a variable. If I want to tell Mathematica that I'm talking about a math equation equals, I do equal, equal, double equals. Now I gotta give Mathematica arguments. What the arguments Mathematica is looking for in contour plot is the range of X, Y's and Z's that it wants that it thinks I want to use to do this. So I'll, now I'll bring in X, Y, and Z ranges. In fact, I'll steal them from up here. So copying and pasting is your friend. And I'll add one more list for Z. Good. And now let me do some indenting so we can read this. So now what I've done is told Mathematica, I want you to plot this equation. I want you to look in a box where X, Y, and Z range from minus two to two. And I want you to find all the points in there that satisfy that equation. Okay, I've got some error messages. I gotta find out why. Indeterminate expression, indeterminate expression. I don't know what I've done, but I don't think I've constructed a sphere, <laughs> but it's beautiful. Let's get rid of this picture. But all I know from these error messages is I made a mistake in a power somewhere. So I gotta go back and read X squared, Y squared, Z squared. Oops, not Y squared. I did not make that error in order to illustrate this for you. I just made a typo. Okay, let's try it again. But when you flash an error messages, find out why. The error messages are not always consumable by humans, but you can still find out why. Holy cow, that was beautiful. Look at that. Here's a sphere. This is what I think spheres should look like. And it's nicely rounded like a sphere as I rotate left, right, up, down. Okay, now I'm a little bit happier. 
Now, I want you to understand how mathematically uses contour plot, however. Again, go ahead. Uh, Oh, not a problem. I'll put that right on this list after I say something about contour plot. Thank you, Toto. Mathematica is only looking inside this box from minus two to two, minus two to two, minus two to two, and finding points whose square X, Y, and Z coordinates sum to four. It is not drawing a surface. It's just collecting points that satisfy this equation. And when it collects the points, it creates a sphere. But Mathematica doesn't think of this as a sphere necessarily. It just thinks of it as a collection of points that satisfy an equation. Now, as I did above, maybe I can ask it to do two things at once. So we've played with this combination of sphere and cylinder. Let's add a cylinder and ask Mathematica to look at that. So cylinder equation. I'm trying to find uh, one that's handy. Let's try x minus one raised to the two plus y raised to the two equals one squared. This is a cylinder, a radius one, centered at the point in the x, y plane. x equals one, y equals zero, and z is free. So this is going to go up and down the z axis. Remember, I have to use double equal for mathematical equal. And remember, I want Mathematica to plot two things. I need to tell Mathematica, here is a list of things to plot. Okay, now I got my cylinder and my sphere at the same time. And then I can go about decorating them in various ways. But contour plot is like a blunt instrument. If you don't know what this thing is, contour plot will do a very good job of finding you points that satisfy this thing. But it's not the best control I could have over a sphere. That would be under parametric plot, which I'll demonstrate later. So raw, straight ahead, let's plot a function sphere, not completely satisfactory. Blunt instrument, let's find all the points that go on a sphere. That's much prettier but still it doesn't allow me great control. So I'm gonna switch back to my paper now to answer the question that was submitted. So plot 3D and contour plot give you methods of plotting. Parametric plot gives you much better control over a surface that you're trying to plot. Spherical plot, Seems like it must be built to do spheres, but there's a catch. Graphics, 3D, that's a plot structure that allows me to assemble a lot of useful pieces. Okay, question was submitted. Distance between two lines. Distance between a line and the plane. No problem. We'll pick something to illustrate this. Uh, the question is two skew lines, but we could find the distance between any two lines if they don't already intersect. Two intersecting lines, we would say the distance between them is zero. When someone says distance between two lines or distance between two planes, it's understood they mean the shortest distance that you can find. So first, let me demo distance between two lines. And we could do two dimensions or three dimensions. We did this in a presentation in a previous session, but and the idea is different between two dimensions and three dimensions, but the concept is still the same. The weapons you're using are the dot product and the box part. 
and the box product, dot product and cross product and box product. So these are the tools that describe the relationships of distances in space, distances and angles. So let's make up an example right here. Let's say I have two lines. Let's say line one. And let me give a presentation of line one, say X, Y, Z. And I'm just gonna pick basic numbers. Let's say uh, 2T, 1T, minus 3T. And let's say, uh, plus one minus two, and ah, I'm debating whether I should put a number here. There's already a number plus zero, but let's just say zero right there. Line two, I'm gonna say X, Y, Z. <coughs> oh, minus four T plus, two T minus T, and let's pick numbers here like uh, minus two plus three plus one. I apologize, I have to move the paper up. So here's two lines in space presented in parametric form. Each one has a direction vector, and each one has a identifiable base point. Here the base point is one minus two zero. And here the base point is minus two three one. And the first direction vector is two one minus three. And the second direction vector is minus four two minus one. Now, there's a couple of things I want to notice immediately about these lines. I just wrote numbers down on the paper, right? And remember in space, I could have four things that happen. These lines could be parallel, not. These lines are not parallel. They could be the same line. I could have just accidentally randomly picked numbers and described the same line in two different ways. Again, not. Not in this case, and it's clear that it's not that. I'll explain why. I could have two lines in space that intersect in a point, or I could have two lines that are skew. And the two lines that are skew or parallel, I would find their distance. But if they intersect, the distance is zero. And if there's the same line, the distance is zero. So first, let's eliminate these cases. Are these lines the same? Are these lines parallel? Are these lines skew? What's the fourth option? Are these lines intersecting? Okay. I know that they're not the same and they're not parallel because their direction vectors do not line up. When one vector is a multiple of another vector, plus or minus scaled multiple even, then the vectors are called parallel. They're pointing either in the exact same or exact opposite direction. And these vectors are not multiples of each other. So this cannot be the same line and the lines cannot be parallel. Still, I need to know whether they're intersecting or skew. Now let's think about this logically. Space is awfully large. So if I just have two elements right here and I pick these numbers at random, very unlikely that these two paths are gonna be the same. But I have to check them. I can't make the assumption otherwise. So I need to check if they intersect before I go on to your distance question. So I wanna check if the X coordinates, Y coordinates and Z coordinates ever match at the same time. Ah, that's a bad way of saying it, isn't it? I want to know if the X and Y coordinates and the Z coordinates 
ever share the same point in space. It might happen at different time parameters. So what I have to do is equate the X coordinates, Y coordinates, and Z coordinates. But I have to allow for the fact that they could have the same X coordinate at two different times. Same for the Y coordinate. Same for the Z coordinate. I want you to also look at what you're looking at right here. I've just written down three equations with two unknowns that are linear in fashion, right? If I was to organize these, let's think about this logically. I have two T1s plus four T2s equals minus three. Second equation, T1 minus two T2s equals five. Third equation, I think I like to present things leading off with positive numbers. Three T1 plus T2 equals minus one. Now let's think about your previous experience. These are lines in the plane with variables T1 and T2. So will these intersect? Will L1 and L2 intersect? L1 and L2 intersecting in space is equivalent to asking, do these three lines that I just tossed into the plane intersect? And again, let's think of three lines that I toss on a plane. If I toss three lines into the plane, what are the odds that they meet in one point? Line, line, line. If I just randomly toss three lines in the plane, it's not likely that they meet in one point. In fact, it would be very special if they met in one point. It would be kind of lucky or unusual, but still I have to proceed. So I'm gonna solve this any way that you ordinarily solve equations. Solve for T1 and insert into the other spaces. That would be one option. So uh, there's a variety of ways to solve. Since in the second equation, T1 is presented so nicely, why don't I do that? Let's label these equations one, two, and three. And by the way, we're going to get to the distance question, but the distance question is going to be simple compared to finding out whether these lines intersect. Conceptually simple. So equation two says that T1 is 2T2 plus 5. I can insert that into equation one and three. Two times 2T2 plus 5 plus 4t2 equals minus 3, and 3 times 2t2 plus 5 plus t2 equals minus 1. So the question is, can I find a t2 that does both of these? I can certainly solve for t2 in the first example. Sorry, my paper is a little bit tilted. What do I got? I got four t2s and another four t2s. I got eight t2s and then i got plus 10 on the left minus 3 on the right i shift the plus 10 to the other side minus 13 and here i have six t2s another t2 is seven t2s and then i have plus 15 on the left minus one on the right this is minus 16. and so what do i say about these three equations, three unknowns. I can find a T2 in the first equation that works minus 13 over eight. I can find a T2 in the third equation that works minus 16 over seven. But I cannot find one copy of T1 and T2 that make all three of these equations work. All right, so what do we say? about this system. 
There is no solution. There is no T1 and T2 that makes all three of these the same. Uh, I did this by substitution. That wouldn't necessarily be my favorite method, but it was a method that I could use to demonstrate. So now I know, let's go back up here, that these lines do not intersect. And they must be skew. Now I'm going to go on to the method of distance. And the book presented distance between lines and planes correctly, but not the best conceptual method I could grade it for. So I have two lines in space that do not cross. I'll illustrate that by kind of making one pass behind the other. And now I'll do some more drawings on this. I tried to make this large to make the drawing useful, but it may not be large enough. Let's work it out. I know that this line, let's call this one L1, has a point. I know many points on that line I could make, but I have one already picked out. And I have a direction vector, V1, already picked out. I have point on L2 that I've already picked out. And I have a direction vector on L2 that I already know. It's called V2. So what does this create for me? I know that I can find distances between, say, points P1 and P2 on these two lines, but uh, they may not be the shortest possible distance. What I kind of want to do is visualize finding that place where these two lines are as close as possible. And the simplest way to do that is to use the dot product, the cross product, the box product. Let's form a parallel pipette with this information I have right here. Let's form the vector. I can go either direction. But let's form the vector from P2 to P1. We'll label it in a second. And now let's take the vector v1 and translate it down here. Not awesome at translating vectors, but there's a good attempt. And now let's draw the parallel of piped on my paper. This is red, blue, and green. The green doesn't show up excellently, but let's draw the parallel of piped with these three vectors. Uh, drawing the parallel pipette as best I can. You make things parallel. And then you fill in where you need to, uh, which involves picking up and dropping too many pens. And eventually, this drawing becomes a little bit too cluttered to be useful. But I am creating an image. Okay, this is the last time I'll pick up a different colored pen. But here I've created a parallel piped out of these three vectors. No more colors. P2, P1, V1 and V2. And I'm interested in the raw distance between lines L1 and L2. Well, let's think about V1 and V2. This creates an area for this parallelopiped. And that area is equal to what? The number that represents that area is the same as the number that represents the length of the cross product of V1 and V2. Let's lay the cross product of V1 and V2 in there like that. And what I want to do is take this box and project it onto that cross product. 
so that I know the shortest possible distance between these two lines. The height of that box will be the shortest possible distance. And this is how he presents it in the book. But then he just gives you a formula and says, you know, just plug things into the formula. Well, how do I find the height of the box? The height of that box is logically volume divided by its base area. Now, you know the base area that I've shaded in black right here is the magnitude of V1 cross V2. And you know the volume of that box, the barrel parallel pipe head, is the box product, V1 cross V2 dotted with, here I chose the order P2, B1. I could have chosen a different order. You know that this box product could be positive or negative. So to give me volume, legally, I have to take the absolute value of that number. So here's a calculation I can perform to do the height of that box. It's literally projecting this vector P2, P1 onto this normal vector to find out what is the height of this box. So maybe a good size drawing here. It's a little bit useful, but you even see how you got to plan drawings, right? Drawings should be very big so you can have all the elements you want. Okay, now it's time to bring in the calculations. So let's do P2 to P1. Let's construct that vector going from P2 to P1. It's from minus two to one. That is taking three steps forward in the X direction. From three to minus two, that is taking five steps backwards in the Y direction. And from one to zero, that is taking one step backward in the Z direction. Good. Uh, we already noted V1 and V2, which were two, one, minus three, and minus four, two, one. Negative one, that is. And now we're ready to do the box product. Uh, we might as well cross V1 and V2 because we're going to use that anyway. I could set up a box product totally right. But let's cross V1 and V2, and then the dot product and the magnitude will be easier to execute. So let's do V1, excuse me, cross V2. Carefully and correctly, which I don't always do, but let's try it. So V1 cross V2 is negative one, subtract negative six in the first slot. That sounds like five. In the second slot, it is negative two, subtract 12. It's negative 14, but the second slot, the J slot is opposite. So that is plus 14. Remember, that's negative two, subtract 12, negative 14. I'm blocking out the J slot. I take the opposite as positive 14. Block out the K slot now. I have four minus negative four, which is eight. I should double check this, double check it how. Let's dot with V1 and V2 because this should be perpendicular to both V1 and V2. So if it's not that, then I know I've made an error. I could still have made an error, but at least dot product with V1 and V2 should be zero. So dot product with V1, give me a 10 plus 14 minus 24, check. And dot product with V2, give me a minus 20, 28, minus eight, zero, check. So this at least dots to zero with both of these, which means at least it's in the right direction, which will give me the right answer, even if I didn't have the exact V1, V2, but you have to be careful with that. Okay, now let's do mag V1, V2. And let's do dot product V1, V2 dotted with P2, P1. I like dot products better than magnitudes. So let's dot with P2, P1. 15 minus 70 minus eight. 15 minus 70 minus eight. Remember, we're gonna take the absolute value of that. Let's double check to be certain, 15. Minus 50 minus 20 is minus 70 minus eight. 
Got it. So 15 minus 78 is 63 negative. 63. Now the mag of the cross product is some, some ugly numbers. Square, 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 add square root, 25, 196, 64. I don't think anything pleasant is going to happen here, but 4 plus 196 is 200, 260, 285. Square root. If I've done it correctly, now I'm going to have to search for confirmation elsewhere, probably. Calculator can do me cross products and dot products. Mathematica can do me cross products and dot products, but I'm illustrating the technique right now. Uh, I don't think 285 simplifies in any nice fashion. I got five going in there, what? 40, 56 times, 57 times, 250, 57 times. It's five times 57. 57 is three times 19. We got 15, 19, 240, 45, 285. No, there's no perfect squares in there. I'm just gonna have to live with root 285. Okay, so now I know the height is equal to the magnitude. I'm just being very formal in my writing. Dot P2, P1 divided by mag B1. And I'll also answer your plain question, which will be a little bit easier than this, but maybe not the same crazy absolute detail I'm going to use. Root 285 divided by 63. Now, there's no harm in estimating that. In fact, you probably agree that it'd be a kindness to estimate that. Because, you know, uh, you know, what time do you want me to pick you up to go to the airport, Dave? Oh, yeah, I think you should pick me up at 17 over 4 o'clock. Nobody talks like that. So you want to know approximately when. Let's just run that through a calculator. But well, we're going to verify it somewhere else anyway. 63. These things are pretty close together. 2680. That's how close they are together. Now, me, I'm just kind of curious. I want to verify this. I want to see all my calculations are correct. I'm going to run that into Mathematica. Then we'll take a break. We can look at your plain question too. But if you understand the principles of this calculation I just did, then you'll understand the principles of the plain calculation. So, I'm going to run that into Mathematica. I'm not going to open a separate notebook. I'm just going to take you back to the notebook we were using and put in some vectors. I got the vector v1, which is vector 2, 1, minus 3. Now, in Mathematica, a vector is a list. So you're going to Eventually, if you use Mathematica more often, even if you use other computer algebra systems more often, you're going to understand what is the fundamental object that that system manipulates. Mathematica, MATLAB, kind of their fundamental objects are lists. Even Python, R, other hot languages right now, fundamental objects are lists. The other v2 was minus 4, comma, 2, comma, minus 1. Got it. Did I copy that right? Yes. And now I had another vector called p2, p1. I'm not trying to be very creative in my naming here, which was 3, comma, minus 5, comma, minus 1. So I just want to run the calculations in Mathematica to see if we were doing this correctly. Now, by the way, if I have any one of these three vectors wrong, it doesn't matter whether I'm using a computer here or a computer at MIT. 
or the most expensive calculator, if I don't have these vectors right, game's over, right? But so you have to make sure you have these vectors right. So what I'm going to do is first tell Mathematica, you see Mathematica says these V1, V2, P2, P1 variables are blue. That means I haven't told Mathematica what they are yet. Notice I'm using a single equal sign for assignment. So I have to hit shift enter. Now these things are black and Mathematica acknowledge, acknowledges the receipt of these three vectors. So I'll just do what? Let's slowly build this up and let's do the cross product of V1 and V2. 5, 4, 18, so I agree with that. And let's build that formula from there. I don't have to build the formula in a new line, but what I wanna say is what's the norm of that cross product? How long is it? 285. I want you to also understand that you could find norm by doing what? Dotting a vector with itself and taking the square root. That's the more classical way to find that. So I could say, let's take the dot product of cross product of V1 and V2. So dotting the vector with itself and then taking the square root is a more classical way to do that. You get the same answer. And then I mention that because sometimes norm has to be too careful. Norm is a sophisticated command in Mathematica. It has to be too careful. So sometimes it returns, you guys have seen this and showed me this in your notebooks. Of an answer with assumptions in it or absolute values in it. So you can, if you're dealing with just a raw vector, you can take this definition, square root of dot product of a vector with itself. Anyway, I'm happy with my norm because it returns the same value. So I'll just keep that. Now, what am I supposed to do with that norm? I'm supposed to be dividing what? I'm supposed to be dividing cross product of V1 and V2. And I'm supposed to be dotting that cross product with P2, P1. So I'm building the expression on the top. Let's dot that with v, P2, P1. Now, Mathematica does allow uh, me to use dot product and cross product symbols. And you can look up how to do that. Remember, I'm just the command line dinosaur. Uh, Mathematica's braces are not happy yet because one of them is colored red. So what do I want to do? I have not finished the dot product brace. There we go. Now I have a cross product inside a dot product inside a numerator. And Mathematica says 21 negative root three over 95. Now, what should we do about that? Oh, I'm supposed to take the absolute value at the top, right? So the command of mathematic is absolute value. And this still looks goofy, but if you multiply top and bottom by three or top and bottom by root 95, I think this would simplify, or I hope it would simplify into what we want. You know, see what we're gonna do? Let's check the numerical approximation. That's another command in Mathematica. Just a simple N brackets, numerically approximate. Okay, so now we have found an error, right? Or it might be an error. Let's see what we can do to take this apart. Let's do our cross product again. That turned out to be what we want. Let's do the dot product of that cross product with P2, P1. Minus 63, that turned out to be right. What am I missing? Let's do the norm of the cross product. That turned out to be right too. So maybe I entered something else incorrectly into my calculator. I want that to be a square root of 285. So what did we do here? We got to go back to our paper and then we see it immediately, right? I entered these upside down. The dot product absolute value was a 63. 
cross product magnitude was 285. So now we correct our error. And ask the calculator to take the reciprocal. And this is 3.7318, which is exactly what Mathematica said. 3.7318. Okay. I do not make errors intentionally to illustrate things to you, but I do make errors all the time. And you make errors all the time too. All I can do is make fewer errors, make errors less often, and conscientiously try to verify things so I catch my errors. That's my responsibility. That's your responsibility. Okay, we're gonna take a break now. But uh, this is why you use a machine, calculator or otherwise to verify your answer independently and make sure you didn't make an error. Okay, let's say that we're gonna, fair time to do a break. We'll do your other question too. Let's come back at uh, three, eight. Let's come back at 9.08. I'm gonna mute my microphone and stretch my legs for a second. You should do the same and then we'll get to your other questions. Thank you.
okay, back pretty much right on the dot here. So uh, again, sometimes when you're in a presentation in person or online, you would say, oh, that error is kind of annoying. Oh, that error is, why doesn't he see that? Why doesn't she see that? You were probably screaming at the camera as I wrote this down. But I think I think there's you got to look at this very very carefully. No one is free from errors, and a much worse thing you do is when you're making an error, you say, "Oh, I'm doomed. I'm tragic. I cannot possibly learn this because I keep making errors." Well, I've been doing this for many many years, and I'm still making errors. What's the cure for that? There is no cure. The best you can do is verify your calculations carefully and independently, right? So do not assume that you will not make an error. And do not assume when you do make an error that you've failed to understood something. You just made an error. Correct the error. OK, so there was a question now about how about distance from line to plane. And so what? we want to do is summarize all distances, right? So now that you follow this principle, let's talk about two parallel lines. Either in two space or in three space. Do I need to make that crazy box? No, if, if two lines are in the same plane as they would be in two space, or if they're parallel as they would be in three space, then in the same plane, what do you have to do? You only have to make a parallelogram. Now you'll have your point P1 and P2. You'll have a direction vector for one of the lines. Let's call this direction vector V. The direction vector for the other line may not be presented in the same way. Let's call this line two and line one. Maybe it'll be twice as scaled. Maybe it'll be minus three times that, but it'll be in the same direction, plus or minus. It's gonna be pointing in the same way in plain English, right? So what do we have to do right here? We have a parallelogram. And the parallelogram is P1, P2 cross V. That's the area. Cross product is a vector. I take the norm. That's the area of the parallelogram. I divide by the base of the parallelogram, which would be mag V. And now I have what? The height of the parallelogram, which is the direct distance from one line to the other. So area is defined by cross product. Volume of the parallel of pipette uses a cross product. And what do they do in both cases? They like create a normal that you're projecting onto. But if the lines are already parallel, you're already stuck in two dimensions, whether you're in two space or three space. If the lines are parallel, even in three space, they lie in the same plane. So this is sufficient area divided by base. If the lines are in three space and they don't lie in the same plane, then I have to pull out my three-dimensional tool, the box product. Now this is presented in the text pretty much exactly like this, but I think sometimes the text presents things as like, Here's the magic formula. Now go do this spell 
as if it was a spell in a Harry Potter movie. Execute this spell, you get the answer. You know, your opponent is humiliated. Your opponent here is the distance between two lines. No, 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 no. Everything has a simple and physical explanation. You have to think about it in that physical way. So now let's do a plane and a line and see if you follow the physical explanation. So now I draw a plane and I'll draw a line that's on top of this plane and parallel to it. So this line is not intersecting that plane. Although on paper, that's really hard to realize. Now, if it's not intersecting that plane, and by the way, if it was intersecting the plane, I could find the point of intersection and I would call the distance zero. But if it's not intersecting that plane, then how should I think of distance? I can certainly name points on that line. Let's call this line L, and let's name a point on that line called P. I could certainly name direction of line. Let's call the direction of the line V. But what do I have from the plane? And uh, I guess I was gonna use P for plane, but I've already used P for point, so I gotta be careful. What do I have from this plane? Should we give this plane a name? Let's call it plane Q. What do I have from this plane that I can use to talk to this line? Well, what is it that's the most natural object about any plane? Any plane is determined by its what? Normal vector. A plane is defined by its normal vector. In fact, the standard equation of a plane displays the normal vector. Which is a little bit why I don't like in the text how he says subtract D equals zero. I want you to focus on that normal vector, ABC. So I think this is a standard form to write the equation of the plane. He calls his a standard form. Okay, everybody's got a different way of expressing things. But where is that normal? That's a normal vector that's like sticking straight up out of the plane. So how am I going to create distance from point? or from line to plane? Well, I have any number of points that I can name on this plane. Let's call this point, and I gotta use a letter I haven't used before so I don't have some kind of collision, right? Let's call this point B. And I can draw a vector from B to P. Let's call the vector BP. And then think of this N as a flagpole. I can project that vector BP onto the flagpole. I want to find out how tall that vector projects onto that flagpole. And that distance right there, from there to there, is going to be the distance between that point and that line. So now I just got to figure out, well, how do I find that projection. I mean, I talked about projection of one vector onto another before, didn't we? So let's figure out how I do that distance. This is the projection of BP onto N. So let's think for a moment about the projection of BP onto N. Now the vector projection of BP onto N, it's a vector itself, right? A tiny green vector. My drawing is not Excellent now, but I don't want the vector projection. I just want to know how long it is. That's the D. So what I'm asking for is the projection. 
I want to know the magnitude of that vector. And I'm going to call that magnitude the distance from the plane to that. So I get out my projection formula, which is BP dot N, N dot N. All these formulas that we're discussing, by the way, are presented on our formula sheet, formula sheet one. That's my distance. This looks like a horrid mess, right? But first, let's remember that these are all numbers. Dot product is number, dot product is a number. So when I take the magnitude of these, remember dot product can be positive or negative in this upper case. So distance needs to be positive. Let's do BP dot N, absolute value. n dot n is mag n squared. I do not need to protect that with absolute value because magnitude is always greater than or equal to zero. Magnitude of a vector is always greater than or equal to zero. In fact, it's only zero if the vector was zero. And if I have a real plane here, this normal vector is not zero. So to take the magnitude of bp dot n over n dot n times n, to take the magnitude of the projection means I take the magnitude of these three things, number, number, vector. And the magnitude of a number is its absolute value if it's positive or negative. The magnitude of this number is always positive. Anyway, before I took the magnitude, the absolute value would not change that. But now I'm left with the magnitude of n. This is not the unit normal vector, by the way. We're not talking about the Frenet frame. But what do I get this, out of my beautiful projection formula? I get a magnitude to cross out, and now I know the distance from that point to that plane. Well, distance from the point to the plane or the distance from this line through the point to the plane. Now let's execute it on an example. And let's say my line was, Let's just make up a line, x, y, z equals, equals, equals. Let's, I'm just picking generic letters, 2t, 2t, and minus 3t, plus 1, plus 5, minus 7. I'm just picking raw numbers out of the air. Let's say my plane, q, was uh, 3x minus 2y plus 5z equals 12 you know, just strange numbers out of the air. And now let's execute. Oh, sorry, I forgot to do the mag bars on the end here. Since I pick strange raw numbers out of the air, I think I'm not gonna get a pretty answer. And I still have one thing left to do. I still have not specified a point on the plane. I have to read it off and I have not specified a a point on the line, excuse me, and a point in the plane. So I need a point on the line, which I'll take right off the line, one, five, minus seven. Any point will do, but that's the one that's staring me in the face. I need a point on the plane. And I can take that off this equation. I just gotta find a point that satisfies this equation. I could do that in many ways, but uh, a simple one, if I wanna make 12, is four, zero, zero. I did not pick 12 for that reason. I just randomly picked 12. But you can always find a point on the plane by letting two of the variables be zero and finding out what the third variable is, whatever is missing. So now I have a true BP. My B to P, B to P is minus three, five, minus seven. My n is right off this plane, three minus two, five. So now I just have to execute dot BP and n, negative nine, negative 10, negative 35. What a mess. Negative nine, negative 10, negative 19, negative 35. Is that negative 54? 
Remember, we should seek confirmation, right? And what's the mag of n? 9, 4, 25. 9 plus 4 is 13. 25 and 13 is 38. I didn't think it was going to be pretty. Square root of that sum of squares. 38 does not have any perfect squares inside it. 2 times 19. So I can just say the answer is 54 over root 38. That is completely simplified. Uh, some people like to say no square roots in the bottom, rationalized denominator, right? I wouldn't tell you to do that unless I specifically gave you instructions. Rationalize the denominator. But I don't think there's anything wrong with the number as it is. That's completely simplified. Let's just get an estimate for general use, 8.75, 8.7600 if I went to that many decimal places, if I needed to go to that many decimal places, 7600 accurate to four decimal places, rounded off appropriately. There's nothing wrong with presenting an estimate as long as you tell people you're estimating, tell people you're approximating, but do not give someone an approximation unless they ask for it, Specifically, don't avoid the real answer and only give the approximation. First, give the real answer, then give the approximation if they ask for it or if you feel it would make things more useful. I think this makes things useful. 8.76 units away, this line in this plane is. I am just going to run to Mathematica and verify that. And because, you know, why not? We've been preaching that. So I want to say, here's my vector BP, which I claimed was minus three, five, minus seven. And here's my vector N, which I claimed was, I'm making an error right now. Hopefully you can see it. And when I said N, Mathematica came back and said, no, the symbol N is protected. And what is the symbol N? Remember the symbol N is numerical estimate. Now let's say you did not remember that. So let me go to whole share screen right here. So I wanna know what's wrong with the symbol N. Let's find out more information. Well, this does not seem too exciting. Uh, you can always ask Mathematica. You can look in the documentation. Maybe that's the obvious way to do it. Let's look in the documentation. Let's ask Mathematica, what is N, capital N? Mathematica says N gives the numerical value of an expression. M with little n attempts to get a result with n digit precision. Oh, it's how I approximate. Okay, so I cannot use n as the name of a vector. In the worksheets we did the other day, we used un for unit normal. I just got to make some crazy name up here. Let's call it nor. Oh, nor is a protected name in Mathematica. Okay, I've had it. Uh, how about normal vector to the plane? Make that a protected name. I think I went overboard, but apparently that is an exception, accepted variable in mathematics because it's not already there. Now I'm gonna pay for that. I'm gonna seriously pay for that now that I have to do the dot product. So I'm just gonna run to dot p normal. Oh, thank Mathematica tries to help me out since I was being silly. It lists the variables that begin NOR, and one of them is normal vector to plane. So here's the dot product, minus 54. That's what I expected. What is the norm of normal vector to the plane? Root 38. Okay, that's what I expected. So I think I'm in serious good territory here. So let me wrap an absolute value around this. 
Remember, it's only as good as my input, right? I'm assuming I have all these vectors correct. There's the actual answer. And then let me wrap an N around it. Give me a numerical approximation. Now I'll unpack this way too much. Just so you can see every line of what I'm doing. Good, numerical approximation of an absolute value of a dot product of two vectors, close dot product, close absolute value divided by the norm of a vector, close norm, close numerical approximation. I hope I have all these things sufficiently executed. There's the 8.75996, I call it 8.7600 to four digits. Uh, you can, in Mathematica, ask for as many digits as you please. So if I want 10 digits, I just say 10 for my norm command. Let me rewrap this because it's very hard to follow in that form, right? Mathematica kind of wraps it up because it's so unwraps because it's so long. But my numerical command could have 10 digits, it could have 100 digits. So you can play with that. Okay, I'm sorry to make that overly long, but this is the concept of distance. Let me go back to my paper. This is the concept of distance. We verified it in Mathematica. I think today I'm recording everything nice. Okay, so uh, that's not a bad thing to do to review distance. So what do I want you to remember now? Distance, I create with the tools. And the tools are dot product, cross product, box product. And I can create my formula depending on the situation. Formula could look like this. Formula could look like this. Formula could look like this. Notice if I put these two side by side, which isn't easy to do, I'll try to do it. These two formulas, this formula and this formula are the same. They're both talking about dotting with a normal. Here I dotted with a normal and the normal is V1 cross V2. And there's the mag of the normal, mag V1 cross V2. And here's the vector that I was projecting P2, P1, or BP. So both of these equations are the same. They're the idea of let's dot with a normal. Whereas the idea of distance right here is let's create a parallelogram. So distance was either creating a parallelogram or a parallel pipe in, and then modifying it appropriately. Thank you for that question. That was a very important idea, a very important question. Okay. I'm willing to entertain any other question. I'm willing to go back to the graphics thing I was looking at. It's your pleasure. You want your questions answered. So, um, go ahead. I, 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 I had a question. I don't know if it's too specific to the exam for you to answer it, but. You can only try and I can say yes or no. If I know how far the slice of a sphere is from its center, how could I calculate its radius? Okay, let's, now, how, however we're gonna address that question, let's make sure everybody even who's watching this later knows what question we're talking about anyway. So let me pull up the exam, but you tell me what, you're asking this in relationship to. Are you asking this in relationship to a particular question? You're, yeah, it's, I mean, it, it, it would be part of the process for doing number one on the exam. Okay, let's pull up number one and just so, and let me get the document out and then we'll share it. And then we'll decide whether we can address this question or not. So I'm going to share. I got a screen. 
I got an exam. Uh, let me make this better on my desk. It doesn't really change it on your viewing. But you say you're asking about, oh, wrong question. This is the wrong exam. I apologize. Those differential equations. So let me try again. <laughs> Exams. We're looking for the exam one. We're looking for vector calculus. I think we got it. And now we're looking to share. Okay. Are we looking at the correct exam? It looks like we are looking at the correct exam. Okay, thank you. So now let's go to problem one. And that's a relatively good size to read. So let's read this problem. Consider these two spheres, S1 and S2. Uh, they intersect in a circle. Uh, I did not ask you to prove that, but uh, a little bit of visualization. Two spheres do not have to intersect at all, but if they do intersect, they can do it in a multitude of ways. They could just touch at a single point. They could actually be the entire same sphere in disguise. Or if they overlap and they're not the same, any overlapping has to produce a circle. You can think about that for a second. Now show how to calculate the radius and the circle of intersection accurate to the nearest thousandth of a unit. So notice how I'm asking for an approximation here. So there must be, the exact answer may be too messy to present. I'm allowing you to approximate, but you have to approximate correctly. Show how to calculate the equation of the plane which holds the circle. Standard form, A, B, and C exactly. D might have to be an approximation. Okay, so before we ask you to restate your question, let's assume that these two spheres intersected in a circle. I suppose that's probably something you want to check because I could have made a mistake. Maybe they don't intersect. But if they do intersect in a circle, that circle does lie in a plane. The circle is a two-dimensional animal. So that is the purpose of the question. So uh, thank you for stating it, but now restate it so that everybody's, because we, we got the context now. So if I have, if I know how far the slice of the sphere that is the intersection is from the center of one of the spheres, how could I calculate its radius? I, I think that might be. Are you looking for the radius of the circle or the radius of a sphere? Which the radius? Circle. Yeah, I think you're going to have to. Now let me see how we should look at this. Let me see what we can say. Do you agree that the two spheres should intersect in a circle? Yes. Okay, that's not your issue. Uh, you, you could verify it. I'm assuming these two spheres intersect in a circle. If they intersect in a circle, there has to be a radius of that circle. So that we're gonna take as given. So you're saying the radius of the circle, well, you know how these two spheres differ from each other. You know their centers and radiuses. Do you acknowledge that? Yes. So if you were to make a drawing of some kind, you should be able to relate the centers and radius of the spheres. You have two centers and two radiuses, radii. I'm guessing you're supposed to relate that to the center and radius of the circle that is a third center and a third radius. So that is the best I can say immediately. And, uh, and that may not have addressed your question. So you, your question was more possibly how, how is what you're gonna show me. but. But I think you should focus on that. I have three radiuses in this question. I have three centers in this question. I need to know how they relate. Is, do you wanna say that or ask it again in a different way or does that help at all? Maybe that's too general to be helpful. I guess the first thing I say is try to draw a picture. 
not a perfect picture, as I did with my lines and planes right now. Draw a schematic picture and see if you can understand the three centers, the three radiuses, and how they might relate. Okay, thank you. I, I, uh, yeah, there's no harm in asking a question like you just did. I'll answer it as far as I can. I think in this problem, that's as far as I can answer that question. Is there, and, and I can, I, I'll keep this on my desktop just in case something else comes up. I got my Mathematica notebook here just in case something else comes up, but I'm gonna go back to my paper and camera right now. Okay. Uh, it's a good question. And I'll offer this advice just in general about any problem if the problem's in three dimensions or even in 10 dimensions, which we're not gonna do, the beginning of understanding it is almost always some kind of drawing or diagram, you know, picture worth a thousand words kind of thing. This picture in front of you right here with the plane and the normal vector. I have no, there's no way I could credibly say, oh yeah, that's the plane three X minus two Y plus five Z equals 12. Oh yeah, that's the line that I described here, right? But this is a representation of the plane and the line. And it's good enough for me to understand how the pieces interact. So even if you make a crazy drawing or an unbelievable drawing at first, begin by drawing if you want to see something. That's actually very powerful advice. Try that in any situation when you're stuck. Can I draw it? Can I make a diagram? Uh, is there a, another question anybody would like to ask or throw in the chat? Or I could do, I could pick up another place from that uh, diagram of the sphere plotting that we did earlier. I'll do that unless there's another question raised here. And remember in this situation, we're interacting with people that are present physically and we're interacting with people that are reviewing this later. So I'm trying to be equal to both sets of people. <laughs> if you don't have a question you elsewise want to address, let me go back to this Mathematica notebook and show you one more way to draw a sphere, which is more valuable than the first two I showed you. I'm gonna go back and share my Mathematica notebook. I got all these calculations sitting here. I think I don't want all these calculations sitting here. I'm gonna delete some of these by clicking on the cell brackets that organize them here, just deleting them so I can get back to my spheres. Okay, now I'm back to my spheres. There's one more way to plot a sphere that is awesome, more powerful in fact, and that's with parametric plot 3D. Parametric plot 3D is like describing how the sphere is painted, tile by tile, so to speak. So if I wanted to parameterize a sphere, the fastest way I could do that is in spherical coordinates. And now I'm gonna be just naming variables here. I'm gonna call them rho, phi, and theta. I can do Greek letters in Mathematica, but I can just type row and call it row. So in spherical coordinates, what was the X of a sphere? Row, sine, capital sign, square brackets, phi, capital sign, square brackets, theta, 
Now it's time to cut and paste. What was the Y coordinate? It was sine phi. Oh, the X coordinate was cosine theta, sine theta. And then this was cosine, sorry, cosine phi. Okay, let me put these three things together. Let me expand my notebook. That doesn't quite get everything on the same line. That gets everything on the same line, but still messy. This is the spherical coordinate description of X, Y, and Z in general. Now remember that's three different things, so I'm going to put it into a list. And now let's draw a sphere of radius two. That would just be rho is equal to two. And now my only variables here are phi and theta. So I have to describe phi and theta. Here I'm allowed to do that in either order because the parametric plot is kind of agnostic. Whatever I name the variables is sufficient, but I'm gonna follow the mathematical convention. Phi is angle from the vertical. So phi goes from zero to pi and theta goes from zero to two pi. There we go, keeping that open, thank you. And now let's check this out. There's a sphere. Doesn't look any better than the last sphere. But now I'll show you the power of parametric plot. What if I only wanted to draw the upper half of the sphere? Oh, let's just let phi go from pi over two. Ta-da, there's the upper half of the sphere. What if I only wanted to draw the Western hemisphere? Well, I don't know if I drew the Western hemisphere or the Eastern hemisphere there, right? Let me shrink that box down. See, with this parametric description of the sphere, I have total control over what I draw. I could even draw a patch from uh, phi is pi over four to pi over three. And theta goes from I two pi over three to five pi over six. Now you can visualize what's going to happen before I press the button. What I'm going to get is a sphere, but only a portion of the sphere between two angles from the vertical and two angles from the horizontal, positive x-axis. I get a little patch of a sphere. Now that is not too helpful because I can't visualize where this patch is in context, right? So I could improve that context by giving me back my box of two by two by two, say plot range. And now let's specify the X, Y, and Z window here, minus two to two, minus two to two, minus two to two. Notice I didn't say X comma minus two to two, Y comma minus two to two, Z comma minus two to two. Plot range is an option that just needs the numbers in each coordinate, not like X minus two to two. So you have to look up how to use plot range. But now if I do that, ah, that's interesting. Now I see that I just drew this tiny patch of the sphere. Now if I wanted to emphasize that, let's show a clever way to emphasize that. Let's call this repeated right here. Let's call this thing that I did the patch. And let's suppress output. And let's call this the whole sphere. 
and let's suppress output. But let me go back to my whole sphere, which is zero to pi and zero to two pi. Got it? And now let's do another decoration on this whole sphere so I can see the difference. Whoops, bad comma, sorry. Let's do plot style. The plot style, notice the capitalization that's required here. So Mathematica prompts you. And let's say the plot style will be both blue and transparent. Blue with opacity of 0 0.2. Let's try it out and see if we like it. Okay, so now I've drawn a patch, specified no color, but do you see how easy it is to specify a color? I'll just grab this thing that I just did and insert it. Let's make this patch red. Ah, let's make it green. Green is a little too uh, bright for me here. Let's make this eight transparency. I got a patch, I got a sphere. What am I gonna do? I'm gonna show you. The patches here. Oh, I notice Mathematica says patch. What patch? We don't need no stinking patch. Because I did patch with a lowercase p here and an uppercase p there. Now that's a different variable. I got to change one or the other. Let's, since I've already Describe patch. Notice I put an uppercase P here and Mathematica makes it blank, uh, black, excuse me. Now Mathematica is acknowledging, yes, I know what patch is. And let's check this out. Here's my sphere with my green patch in the back. Now this looks uh, suspiciously like a Death Star. Uh, maybe I should make this patch circular. Maybe I should make a trench around the equator of the Death Star with a special opening that the engineers of the Death Star put in just so it could be blown up easily. Okay, bad movie reference. But the idea here is look at what parametric plot gives me. Parametric plot gives me powerful control over what I'm presenting to you. You know, I think all these lines are distracting. You know what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do one more decoration here. How about mesh is none. So all kinds of options, commands in Mathematica have many, many options. And you can look up the options by looking up the commands. But let's take a look at this now. That's, I, I think uh, maybe I like the mesh on the blue thing. I don't know. Mesh all. No, no, I don't think so. Mesh full. Okay, that's not so bad. I, I don't know, I'd have to compromise. I could probably control these mesh lines if I wanted to. And uh, I don't want to mess with that. I mean, I'd, I'd have to look up the documentation how to control that. So I'll just go back to mesh none. There. There's my sphere, which is blue. It doesn't have much context since it's just a blue blob. But there's my green patch of the sphere that I created both with parametric plot. Full sphere and patch of sphere. Okay, that is something I wanted to demonstrate. Now, let me go back to my paper now. So demonstrated plot 3D, parametric plot 3D, contour plot 3D. A spherical plot 3D is also a simple way to draw a sphere, but in Mathematica, spherical plot 3D uses theta for the angle from the vertical and phi for the angle from the positive x-axis. So caution when you use that. You could look that up and play with it. Danger. Graphics 3D we've illustrated in the things that we posted 
on Tuesday about adding arrows and such to our little Frenet frame demonstration. We could do more of that later. But I guess these are the big three, plot, parametric plot, and contour plot. If I'm trying to draw something in Mathematica, these are the big three that I go to daily basis. Uh, in two dimensions, they're just called plot, parametric plot, and contour plot. There's no 2D. 3D is for three-dimensional. There is a cylindrical plot, 3D, which has kind of been discontinued in Mathematica, but you can still find it in the documentation and use it. So you can plot in cylindrical and spherical coordinates, but the quickest way to plot in cylindrical and spherical coordinates is to use parametric plot, as we just demonstrated. And show is powerful command because it allows you to make a list of things that you've created. Manipulate, we haven't used very much. But manipulate is also very powerful because it allows you to animate some structure that you've created. It could be a picture or it could be an algebraic calculation. Okay, we're gonna cut it off here. We're going to uh, record this, get the notes and the recording posted, and then you can keep working on your exam. You can send me questions about the exam as you work up until next Tuesday. I will answer them to the best of my ability or as far as I can answer them as we demonstrated on one question this morning. But uh, don't hesitate to ask. If I can't answer the question, I'll just say, I, I can't answer that question, sorry. So I'm gonna stop the recording right here. You guys have a good weekend.